Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? My name is Dan, aka the Jazz Shepherd, and behind me you'll see my flock of records. That's what I'm shepherding. I think sometimes people wonder what the reference is about, and it's about obviously my longtime collection, which I've been collecting since probably 1990. Uh, first of all, today I want to talk to you real quick about the trading cards. I got a lot of work done. I made the fronts for the 550. I got about another 150 to go. I think I'll stop around 700 in this initial set. But uh, having made those front for all those cards, trying to get a grasp on how big the series is going to be, I didn't want to start printing anything until I had a good knowledge of all the other intricacies and things I wanted to add and make sure I was all very fluent. But then I got to the point where I wanted to start looking at printing the first nine which you know makes up a page obviously and uh there were some issues with the size with uh things not printing as clearly as they were as i can see them on my screen and that was a lot to do with color certain colors weren't coming through very good in the printing process so i'm going to, have to go back and edit every one of those cards and i spent a lot of time the last couple of days just getting these first nine to the point where they're fairly easy to read. You can see that organ on the Jimmy Smith there. Uh, I, I'm just gonna give these out to people, whoever wants them, as I get closer to finishing these up. I got the backs made for these first nine as well. And they have what I call five, five fun facts. And then on the bottom they have five records that I recommend. Some of them might be um, side work they did that was important might be just all their own records depending on who they are uh, as I get deeper into the series some of these some of these might be tougher to fill in but for the most part most of these guys are gonna be pretty easy to put together little bios on the back so again it's a process now I'm having a tough time making my printer want to print these in the right order so that these match up on the back with the right card I tried to find a template yesterday that would help me do that I ended up downloading some stupid virus on my computer Again, I'm so computer not efficient. I'm not a great technology person. My wife helped me fix that when I got home last night. But again, we're getting, we're making progress. And so it's cool to see some of the backs coming together with the fronts. And I think what I'm going to do is try to have, when I get this first set done, first nine, I'll put them out there for you guys to download them. How exactly I'm going to do that even, I'm not even sure yet. Uh, and then I'll probably add one set a week something like that and I'll keep finishing up as I go uh, that's been a lot of work I've put probably a couple hundred hours into these already I'm not working right now and on that front I think I'm tracking down a job DJ job uh, with an old friend who has a restaurant in the Twin Cities I guess it'd be a long commute but I think I got a good thing coming together so say a prayer or put a positive thought out there in the universe for me because I need to get that DJ work coming in again so that money can uh, help keep us afloat uh, we also made some progress with the Jazz Cafe in terms of uh, the state signed off on most of the health board issues. We resolved an issue with separating the residents from the business. Uh, it was gonna be very cost prohibitive what we were looking at doing initially. Um, and we couldn't even find a really good way to do it to separate the apartment from uh, the cafe. So what we ended up doing was just cutting the back lounge out of the cafe for now, just have it being in the front area. And when we do small events here, we can just probably open that back lounge up anyway, you know, who's going to notice. But uh, it's been a lot of work and a lot of frustration because some of the things you can't rush. And I'm kind of one of those guys who likes to, here's 550 50 cards after three weeks, you know. I like to get things done and you can't rush a lot of that stuff. We got a lot of our estimates in from our contractors and a lot of the numbers are making sense. And with the slightest savings, we think we're going to be on a, on a path where we can actually get this thing going this, this winter, spring. So again, say a prayer for that because it'd be nice to have this little jazz cafe operational. It'd be a nice place to have a coffee and have people come visit. And again, eventually the long-term goal is to have a bed and breakfast in the basement with a couple of bedrooms down there and its own little lounge area. Uh, we still got one of our kids down there right now, one of my wife's kids, but in a couple of years, as things kind of move themselves along, that's, that's the eventual goal, so people from anywhere can come stay for a weekend, listen to jazz, drink coffee, and we can just sit and chat, talk about the world and the issues that we think are important and agree and disagree. 
and that's part of the discord here on the internet and i think i'm actually pretty lucky i don't get a lot of trolls i don't get a lot of really unhappy people i think a lot of my friends and channels have more issues with that kind of stuff than i do so i think somehow the content just kind of to disinterest those people too quickly and they don't stick around long enough to maybe heckle or to do the trolling that you get on a lot of channels obviously so that being said we're, we're, we're working hard on things you know and the trading cards will be a fun asset it'll be a, something that if you if you collect them and print them off and uh, I'm still exploring other avenues for what to do with them uh, it seems like as much hard as I've worked on my wife has said this as hard as I've worked on them you should be able to make some money on them. But the second I start making money on them, I gotta worry about the licensing with all kinds of issues. So I'm just gonna try to use the fair use thing. Say I'm just using these as free promotional educational tools to help spread the knowledge of jazz. I think if someone were to really understand how jazz looked in 1950, and if you wanna get a grasp of that, get yourself a Playboy jazz poll, Playboy Reader's jazz poll from 1953, 1951, 1956, and look at who is voted in all the various categories as the greats and the most important players of that time and era. And for a lot of you, you're only going to recognize one or two names on those lists. And you're going to wonder where a lot of the names that we think of today as being the jazz canon, where those names are. And the lists are very driven by, of course, white readers and white voters. And the white players were selling probably five times more than any of the black players were at that time. You know, and, and the general rule, Miles is one of the few exceptions. But as you see that timeline in that period, and you see the remnants of the swing era and the small groups that they're creating, and the, the lovely bluesy, soul-driven, gospel-inflected small combos that all those bands are making, uh, Ellington Simon, Basie and his men, the Basie Seven. There's such great music coming out of those groups in smaller packages. And they're really noteworthy recordings. And they were important at the time. And all the West Coast, uh, Stan Kenton, Woody Herman, uh, Claude Thornhill, all those great swing groups, all those white kids in those bands were putting out great records on their own as individuals. And those guys had name recognition that, and that they've slipped into obscurity today. No one knows who they are today. Henry, no. Uh, <clears throat> and so as we move forward, people that had a small slice of the jazz kingdom in the 1950s have slowly broadened and broadened their scope in the eyes and the view of the jazz collector of today and the writers and, and, and historians of today. And even, of course, the marketing from various record labels that I've spoken of many a times has often created the legacies that withstood the test of time as much as the players themselves. And so we've often remembered the black players who were very forgotten at the time and escalated their importance and forgotten a lot of the great white players that existed. And it's really just changed what the scope of things really looked like in the, at the time. And the deeper my collection gets and the more I understand all these different labels and, and the whole spectrum of the industry here in America particularly, it's really enlightening and really it's deceptive what people think the jazz canon is today and miles davis of course being the, one of the prime targets of that his influence and his looming looming over the jazz universe it's so much bigger today versus what, where he was even in 55 56 59 you know he not say he wasn't an important cat by 59 especially with the power he had in Columbia and the great second, first quintet. And you know, Miles obviously had a very important role to play, but Columbia plays a very important role in that as well. So, which is one of the things I've noticed as of late. So today's episode, what I wanna to talk to you is about the great Chicago invasion at Blue Note. And we're well aware of you know the Detroit migration of Blue Note cats, which there was a lot from Thad Jones to Milt Jackson to Donald Byrd. It's a, quite a wave of Detroit cats that came into uh, Blue Note and made an impact. 
and of course Philadelphia, Newark, other places as well. But there was a Chicago wave that actually kind of predates the Detroit wave a little bit, except for being Thad Jones, and uh, it kind of gets overlooked. And in some ways you could really say this early Chicago wave at Blue Note is one of the things that really drives late 50s Blue Note hard bop. And there was quite an influence being brought in from Chicago to New York that helped shift and change the sound of what was happening in jazz at that time. And it was led by, of course, the great Johnny Griffin. And Griffin was the small little giant of a guy who played lightning fast with great melodic center. He was very explosive. He could do the bebop changes and just play really clean and precise. Yet he had the soul to him. And he really had a way of communicating. And he burned down most of the people he competed against in Chicago. He was just chopping people up. And he makes a record at Argo, which is really hard to find, which is a really, really solid record and I really enjoy that. And Argo is such a greater record label than most people really realize. Argo has a lot of very important artists who make pretty important recordings there. But Griffin goes to New York and he, Alfred Lyon gives him, I think, a three or four record deal. And introducing Johnny Griffin in 1533 is really one of the opening wave salvos of the Chicago sound in New York at Blue Note. And Griffin is this one of the most dynamic players in the game? Curly Russell, Max Roach, and Wynton Kelly round that quartet out. And then, not much longer after that, blowing in from Chicago, you get Clifford Jordan and John Gilmore. And they both kind of simmer on the edge of recognition, these two. Gilmore, I think, works with Sun Ra for a while and moves more into the avant-garde in the 60s. Uh, and then Clifford Jordan makes some really great hardbop records that are really kind of overlooked. And Jordan makes a few records on other labels. Like he has a couple on Riverside uh, Jazzland. Uh, he has one on Atlantic with about a Lead Belly tribute. Uh, he's an important cat in the hardbop sound. And he kind of gets forgotten in the mix of all the great tenor players, of all the great hardboppers in New York at the time and that Blue Note. We kind of almost overlook Clifford Jordan, and it's kind of a shame. And this record also has Curly Russell, Art Blakey, and Horace Silver. So you have almost a jazz messenger thing there. Uh, fantastic stuff. And these are very hard, aggressive, uh, prototypical blue note that's really more in line with what happens 1565 to 16 uh, to 1600 in the 1500 series and we're seeing these are happening in 1533 1549 1559 Johnny Griffin and this is an outstanding record memory serves Coltrane's on this one Hank Mobley's on this one Lee Morgan Wynton Kelly Paul Chambers and Art Blakey and it's just a tour de force a wonderful cover and I'm just a huge fan of Johnny Griffin. And he does move on to Riverside and to Prestige. And he starts making a lot of records with Lockjaw Davis, Griff versus Lock, kind of tenor battle records. And Griff and Lock both have very different sounds and tonalities and rhythmic punctuation. So they're fun to listen to. Lock's more laid back and in the groove and got some syrup on that candy. And, and Griff's more explosive and just furious. Uh, big fan of those records. Uh, the record we're listening to right now is John Jenkins, who's actually another one of the Detroit Cats. But I wanted to throw that in there because we're listening to it. And it's actually one of my favorite album covers. And uh, we'll talk about that more when we talk Detroit uh, Blue Note. And we're going to eventually do a series on each of these great jazz cities soon, once my card series is a little bit more wrapped up. Because I hate to uh, do something when I'm not finished with something. So I'm still working on that. 1564, this is actually led by Paul Chambers, but it's still got a, a strong Chicago presence with Clifford Jordan on it. Cool cover, tough to come by, uh, with Donald Byrd out of Detroit, Flanagan's out of Detroit, Alvin Jones is actually out of Detroit. So you're getting quite a, and Paul Chambers was Detroit, but first he was in, he was born in Pittsburgh, if I remember, then went to Detroit and was raised there. So you got Detroit cats pretty strong. 
but uh, Clifford Jordan's also bringing that Chicago sound to this session. And being the tenorman, you know, a tenorman always can inflect a lot on a session. And again, he's kind of an overlooked character. Uh, this is another Clifford Jordan record from the 1565. And right after that last one. And look at the lineup on that. You got Jordan, Lee Morgan on the trumpet, Curtis Fuller on the bone, uh, John Jenkins, the aforementioned on the alto, with Ray Bryant, one of the great rhythm and blues, somewhat like a Wynton Kelly, just in terms of how he plays pocket and, and funk, Paul Chambers and Art Taylor. Outstanding blue note, hard bop. And we're finding that the Chicago Cats are really an impetus in driving the sound. And the Detroit Cats are that next wave that come in and really take it to the world. But Chicago kind of kicks the door open in a way. This is Cliff Craft, Cliff Jordan, Blue Note, 50, uh, 51, 1582, sorry. Another pretty tough to come by record. And on this one's got Sonny Clark, who I'm just the biggest Sonny Clark fan in the world. If you know my channel, you know that. Uh, Art Farmer's on the trumpet. And Farmer makes quite a few appearances as a sideman in this era, late 50s, at Blue Note, while he never makes a record as a leader. He's under contract of Prestige, and he goes to Argo with the Jazz Tat. Uh, farmers at a lot of labels. He was never a leader at Blue Note, which is a little bit sad in a way. It'd be nice to have heard him in the Blue Note aggressive context. But uh, our farmer, Jordan, Sonny Clark, George Tucker, and Louis Hayes, the young Detroit drummer. So you're getting quite an influx of young talent at Blue Note. And that's one of the things I think is very misunderstood about Blue Note. Like Miles Davis, the marketing behind Blue Note today has so inflated the status of Blue Note. If you were to argue what percentage of the Jazz Kingdom Blue Note was in 1955, 1957, 10% would be a gross overstatement. And I would argue it's probably Blue Note's probably 25% of the Jazz collecting market today. And Miles Davis is probably close to 20% by himself. Like, they're so preeminent in people's minds. Miles, everyone's got Miles. Who loves a jazz collection doesn't have Miles records? And Blue Note's gotten such this cachet and coolness factor, and the marketing behind it's so extensive, and the reissue programs and the YouTube channels. Talk of Blue Note, this, Blue Note, that. Reissue this, read out. Music Matters, Toshiba, King, Tone Poet, and all that stuff's great. I'm not dissing any of those reissues. The point is, Blue Note's and part of the jazz world is so overinflated today in the minds of collectors. We need to diminish on some level how big a part of the jazz world they were to understand better the place Blue Note really was in. And unlike Verve at the time, who had a lot of significant name people from the swing era, the Ella Fitzgeralds, the Billy Holidays, the Johnny Hodges, you know, all the big names, Dizzy Gillespie was at Verve. You know, Parker made stuff at Verve. It was, Verve had, Norman Grant had all these greats. Ben Webster, Illinois Jack Kent. The list goes on and on. Sonny Stitt. All, so many greats were doing stuff at Norman Grant's at Verve. And Norman was probably paying the cats a little bit more than these small indie labels in Chicago and New York could or would. And so that talent with some name recognition just wasn't going to sign with a record label like Blue Note, not just because of, they just had, the, the money was not there. The money made more sense to go pay someone where you were gonna get paid. And so what ends up being the case here is Blue Note signing almost all anonymous kids. They're almost all completely unknowns. And most of these cats have Blue Note make a record or two, if any, before signing with Blue Note. And like Mobley and Morgan made a few records at Savoy. You know, a couple of these guys made records at Argo. Uh, a few of these guys start at Prestige first and go to Blue Note, vice versa. You know, it's uh, a few guys made some stuff at Emerson, maybe in Chicago, then went to New York and started working for those labels. Atlanta gets some of those cats in there at times, you know, but Blue Note was just one of many. And the integrity of what Blue Note does is top of the mark, without any question about it. Blue Note's legacy is 
in part not just through the market. I guess in part due to the honest integrity of what Alfred and Frank were trying to do, how restricted they what they recorded was. You had to be bad. You had to have groove. You had to play. You had to have feeling, soul, and guts. And as I've said, after J.R. Montrose, like 1526 or whatever it is, they don't record another white cat for a long time. It's just young, black, hungry kids with a desperate sense of, I got to get this off my chest. You know, that whole sensibility of what jazz I'm seeing is about. I'm a jazz MC. I'm going to speak my soul into this horn and let you know what time it is. And that's just such an important aspect. And prestige is much more regulating uh, sessions in terms of let's make a little more saccharine. Uh, he, in some ways, prestige had very little oversight. They just let whoever showed up make records, blowing sessions. Uh, a lot of them are junkies, which obviously there's guys at Blue Note who have a junk habit as well. Junk was everywhere in black neighborhoods in those days. Thank you, government. That was a wonderful way to suppress a group of people. But it's amazing what the Blue Note legacy is. And what I think is so sad is how today its value and its appreciation is so wrapped up in how expensive they've become and not the artistic or musical innovations that were happening. I hear so many people talking about Blue Note, you know, talking about pressings, talking about records, talking about pricing, talking about grading, talking about the plastilite ear, talking about minutia after minutia after minutia. And yet we're so not talking about why this legacy is so important. And so Blue Note is a high watermark in a lot of ways. And yet none of his legacy today seems to be associated with that aspect. It's become very collectible and hip and it's driven the prices up beyond reasonability, which has only made it more collectible and hip. And now you got people who don't even listen to jazz buying old Paul Chambers Blue Notes because they want to have the prestige of putting that on their shelf or on their wall and don't really grasp what this music was really about. And so while I try to put Blue Note back in its place in the time frame of, the, of, that, of that era, it's very interesting to see how at that time underground Blue Note was and how lack of popular and how unfamiliar people were with Blue Note records. Look at a Playboy Jazz Bowl from 1957, 58, and count the Blue Note people on there. You might find a Jimmy Smith, you know. Uh, guys like Coltrane and Rollins don't make a lot of those lists. Stan Getz does. Jerry Mulligan does. Chet Baker does. You know, the, the, all the great white cats from that era who were selling records. Brubeck, you know, he, of course. But uh, this stuff was very, very, very underground. And it was not a pronounced part of the jazz kingdom in any way in the 50s. And so part of what I'm trying to get across here is as much as we esteem and hold and love these blue notes and as, as valuable as they are, there's entire chapters of the jazz story that are largely forgotten. Plots of land that the archaeologists haven't dug up and found the treasures. And that means there's a lot of records out there at these contemporary labels. You can buy the same music, the same players, the same styles for one-tenth of the cost. And that situation is only going to last so long with prices being what they are and with the Jazz Shepherd saying what he's saying. He's going to push that meter wider. And Prestige Records have definitely gotten more and more collectible. Riversides are definitely heading down that same road where Riversides are starting to become quite collectible. Uh, there's still a lot of Riversides that you can get for a really good price. And almost all of it in that 200, 300, 400 series is outstanding. Really a high level integrity. Uh, Orrin Keepness was really, uh, he did a great product. He really does. Uh, but you have Storyville, you have Bethlehem, you have Savoy. There's just so many great labels. You know, on the, on the West Coast, it was a whole nother schmear of more white 
West Coast cool, cool bop, you know, going on in the West Coast. That's some of the best jazz you'll ever hear. But most people will never hear it because they don't want. They don't think Bud Shank could be cool. They don't know what Serge Chaloff and Shorty Rogers. And again, even those cats. It's why knowing your labels is so important. Because when you buy those guys on a Nocturne, a small label like that, they're going to be cooking. They went to that little indie small label not to get paid, but to make music they wanted to make. You choose your labels for two reasons. Money and artists artistic freedom and so guys who are making records on a big label and made some stuff on small labels here and there sometimes it's those small labels that they're making the stuff that's most them the most what they really want to be doing and so when you hear a guy like Shorty Rogers playing on his RCA stuff which is great when you hear him in a different setting on a small label as a sideman you know with uh, Howard Rumsey the Rumsey All-Stars that's such a who's who of West Coast players it really is. There's a lot of innovators in that West Coast scene, starting with Jimmy Joffrey and Jerry Mulligan. Those two guys are such huge influences on that track of what jazz does. And you could argue that Joffrey and Mulligan have as much impact on the black players as guys like Monk and Parker had on the White Cats. You know, Joffrey and Mulligan, those guys were really compositionally driven. They had brilliant ideas and... Uh, we're taking a lot of Ellingtonia ideas and slipping it into much smaller arrangements and contexts. There's some brilliant stuff. You know, it's, Gil Evans was part of that whole scene. And from cool West Coast to cool bop to just that modern sound that was happening on the West Coast, there's a lot of great jazz out there that just gets overlooked completely that was quite important at the time. And a lot of stuff that wasn't very important at the time has become of the utmost importance today, some justifiably so. And again, Blue Note is deserving of most of the praise it gets, but let's not praise Blue Note because of their expensive. Let's praise Blue, let's praise Blue Note because of the artistic risk that they took. This was the equivalent of taking the chance on Chuck D and Public Enemy and taking a chance on NWA. We're gonna let some black men, young, virulent, militant, angry, frustrated, we're gonna let them express as openly, as honestly, as they choose to. And they can reflect the headlines of the day, they can reflect that lynching down south, they can reflect the protests and riots in Detroit, Newark, and Watts, and everything that's going on. I'm not going to limit them and say, you need to dress a little cleaner. We want you to do this Hollywood soundtrack. And then we want you to do Oklahoma for me. And then please do some of this new Broadway musical. And we'll do some Christmas songs. That was not the expectation that was placed on these men. Especially at Blue Note. Riverside as well. You know, and you feel like it's Savoy and Prestige. Weinstock and, and Lubinsky were very much just kind of money centered and they just wanted to churn product out. They were just, these were cattle, just make me some milk, you know. So you don't get that same artistic sensibility there. But when you're listening to what the Blue Note Cats did and the, some of the stuff at Riverside, this music is so important socially, musically, artistically. Uh, it's, it needs to be remembered in its proper setting. And I think one of the craziest aspects of the Blue Note story at this point is just how inflated they have become legacy-wise and for what reasons. It's pretty nuts. Again, like I said, Blue Note is a small, small piece of the jazz world in 1957. Small piece. And all the stuff that's happening in the charting and the polls and the readers and the writers, what was happening at Blue Note was fairly under the radar, even to the jazz critics. Yet Alfred and Frank did what they did with compassion and sincerity and absolutely recorded one of the greatest legacies in music history. And yet I feel like so few of the people today who are valuing Blue Note and collecting Blue Note and talking Blue Note have any sense of the risk that was taken. They were saying some pretty incredible things
This is Henry. He's a very, very confused cat. He thinks he can knock a record needle off a record and not become cat food at night. Love you, Henry, but you're a little klutzy. He's the most klutzy cat I've ever known. We found him under the porch last winter in January, freezing cold, I think it was New Year's Day. My wife found him, actually our husky dog, our dog found him, found under the, under the porch, and my wife crawled. So once again, my uh, phone ran out of memory there, so I'm gonna finish this up here real quick. So I appreciate everybody. Y'all mean the world to me, or seriously, you guys do. Uh, if you want to support the channel, please go to my Patreon and help support. You know, as little as five bucks a month. Every donation helps. Uh, I'm still between DJ job right now. I need, I need some income. Uh, I'm tracking down something that feels like it's going to be something great. But we're still a long way from making that happen. So prayers are needed. Positive thoughts, whatever you got. Uh, also, the merchandise store has some great stuff in it. From coffee mugs to hoodies to sweatshirts to sweatpants, all kinds of different cool designs. A lot of them were done by my friend Sven Van Voidunk in Belgium. Appreciate him as always. Uh, all you people who support the channel and watch it, it's awesome. You know, it's great that it's growing as fast as it is. I'd like to see it grow even faster. But if it means we're going to pick up the wrong kind of people, I'd rather just grow at the pace we're growing and find real music heads who want to talk about music and care about the right reasons, you know? Uh, so again, thanks to everyone who supports the channel. It does mean a lot to me. And if you're interested in the trading cards, uh, I'm hopefully gonna have the first nine available for you guys to download. And where would be a good site for you guys to download those from? Can I? Can you just download them from YouTube? I don't know if you can, I'm not sure. So curiosity abounds. Like I said, I wish I was more technically savvy. I've learned a lot doing all this stuff. I never watched YouTube before uh, making my channel. I never had a podcast, so we started doing the podcast. So a lot of this stuff is broadening my knowledge base and my media exposure. I don't spend a lot of time watching other talking heads. Uh, a, I like to keep my ideas my own, my thoughts my own, and people can really make you speak other people's thoughts and minds, and I'd rather keep it my own. I have my own knowledge of history, my own knowledge of geography, my own sense of uh, American history that I use to inform a lot of what I say. And um, so I just don't spend a lot of time searching for uh, information. I watch documentaries plenty, but other talking heads, I watch a few people here and there. I enjoy Rick Beato, I enjoy Ken sometimes, but I don't, I don't, I don't have the time either. You know, I'm always busy doing stuff. It's amazing how, how busy I keep myself. I was talking to my wife yesterday. Just messing with my record collection and making trading cards and my channels and all the different things. Commenting, responding to comments. It's amazing how busy I keep myself 12, 15 hours a day. You know, pulling records, putting records back, sorting this. Oh, I want to see this from that perspective. What would all these look like together? And it's all about learning. It's always about grasping something in a new way, in a new light. And I really keep myself fairly, you know, occupied. Even while I'm not working right now, I stay fairly uh, busy, <laughs> which seems ridiculous, I think. I don't think a lot of people could sit in this house as many hours a day as I do and, and not be bored. But I'm rarely bored. I rarely ever turn my television on before, after dinner. When my wife's here and we watch a couple programs together. I don't sit around the house watching TV all day. Don't do that. Too much to do. Too much to, you know... I listen to music. Um, I do want to get back to making throw grabbers, but my listening time has been so different these last few months between the cafe planning and everything that's been going on. Uh, my wife was unemployed for a while as well, so she was here every day. And I've been making these cards on these last two, three weeks, so I've been upstairs in the office doing that, listening to jazz online, which isn't the same as listening to records. So I need to get back to that intensive listening experience of sitting in my record room for hours and letting stuff just wash over me. To get that honest throat grabber response. I don't want to fake it. But I still want to. I've had a few things hit me. And I should have wrote them, written them down. Like, oh, that's awesome. That grabbed me. And I did write them down. I'm kind of kicking myself for that. But I do want to start making those again. Because those were fun episodes to make. And I think those throat grabbers were also great pieces of insight. I think they not only were fun and kind of comical in a way. Much of my reactions to things. But I think it also informed some people how to hear jazz. 
What does that kick in the ribs make you think? What does it make you feel? What must that guy have been feeling to have said that in that tonality? That's part of the magic, is that letting the instruments speak to you. make Let them make you feel something. And I think until you feel jazz and are trying to understand what kind of mood was this guy in when he made this? What's he trying to say to me? What was his experience? What was his environment? What's his personality telling me? Until you're listening to jazz in that context, you're missing so much of it. You're just hearing notes and virtuosity and a byproduct of ego. And that's so not what jazz at its best is about. If you're just listening for innovation and brilliant you know, virtuosity, there's a ton of that out there. A ton of later era jazz is filled with that type of byproduct. But it sounds canned and not necessary. There's rock guitar gods that I'll find very necessary. I don't need to listen to that. It doesn't, doesn't excite me. I'd rather hear something raw and sincere than some guy's incredible ability. But when virtuosity is a byproduct of desperation, and I just said something incredible, not to be incredible, but because my surroundings and situations are incredible, and this is my reaction to it, that's a very different type of virtuosity. And the two sound very different. Ben Webster can give you some of the most soulful, incredible lines, sometimes even with a limited degree of virtuosity in notes. But each note gut punches you so hard with what Grandpa Webster's telling you that you're almost in tears. You're like, oh, man. I, I'm sorry you went through that, Ben. I can't believe they put a black man through that in your time. See, that's, that's the kind of mentality you got to get into. Uh, my husky makes everything in life more difficult. She's wonderful. I love you, Kiki, Kira. But uh, if you've never had a husky, you've never owned a wolf. And of all the dog breeds in the world, there's no breed that does more what they want, when they want, how they want, than the husky. They are unteachable. They're super intelligent. They look at you like, oh, I know exactly what you want, but I ain't fitting to do that right now. Uh, but if you have a piece of meat in your hand, suddenly they go, watch, I can sit here. I'm sitting for you. I want me to lay down. I want me to roll over. She's so cunning. She's so smart. But she's also a ball of destruction. And she can't help at times but see one of the four cats in this house and explode from a sleeping position into a cat chasing position. And I don't think my cats enjoy it none. Daisy, the biggest, I think she enjoys messing with the cat sometimes and teasing the dog and kind of, you know, making the dog chase her. But our littlest cat, Little Butt, doesn't have any time for the dog whatsoever and greets the dog every time with a... a fierce at that one of those... So, dogs and cats, you got to love them. At least they seem to love the jazz. Every time I go down there to play jazz, they uh, all seem to follow me. <laughs> the cats especially will sleep in the sunbeam, listen to me play jazz for hours. And I'm looking forward to getting down in my record room more. And if that coffee shop does open up down there, I'll be down there plenty. So, I'm trying to knock these cards out. Like I said, get as much of them produced now as I can. So that I just got to make little tweaks to them before I print them. Or submit them for you guys to have. Again, it's all a process. I'm still learning. I don't want to jump the gun on any of this and put it out there before they're really ready to be put out there. I think they're coming along pretty good, though, and looking pretty sharp. Uh, they look great online on the screen. And they're starting to look pretty good when you print them as well. So be patient, guys. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy them. And like I said, there's, I've, I've learned so much making them. There's no way you can't have them in front of you and be learning jazz history as you go. And even writing the little bios on the back. It's just fun to have that access immediately to like, oh yeah, Curtis Fuller was raised by Jesuit nuns for a while. Interesting. You know, little tidbits like that. You're just like, that's color. And that's part of how we understand the personality and the experience and environment these men were a part of. So 551 cards have been made so far. And these are just the first rough initial draft. And only nine have been refined down to that more finished product. Even the template I put them in initially was a poster template that was like 16 inches by 18 inches. And I had to find a way to get them down to the right trading card size so they would print the right size. I'm, I'm a dumbass, I got to tell you. I did so much work before I really uh, knew what I was doing. 
But again, there's a lot of things that I wanted to have a scope of before I really try to f fine polish anything. So it's it's part of who I am, and I enjoy doing it, and it's the love of my life. It's my passion, talking about music and understanding it. And the more you understand it, the more you feel it, the more you can talk about it. And so I think that's where a lot of what I say has merit and value, because I do spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. I'm not just reading what I've, someone else said. I'm always kind of feeling from my heart. Y'all be safe. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Peace.